Big 12 today welcomes in a very special guest, Mark Vidal, who is, I don't know, maybe the hardest playing guy in the Big 12. How would you describe the way you yeah, play, Mark? You're right. I'm the hardest player in the country. In the country? Why in would I limit country. you? Yeah, I love it. Hardest player in the you country. Have, you have really kind of made and carved out this role for yourself. Coming out of Lake Charles, Louisiana, you went to high school in Texas. When did you really start carving out kind of the style and the way you want to play? So at the time, it's, it was kind of like it is now. You know, in high school, you know, we had a stacked team. We had Terrence Ferguson, Trey Duvall, uh, Billy Preston, a lot of guys that's in the NBA, Emmanuel Moutier. So we had those guys. And at the time, you know, I'm going to say I wasn't taking it super serious because I was making a lot of ballers lives and just a dunker at the time. So coming to my senior year, I had to really like, you know, prepare and get into a, a role. And I didn't know what my role was going to be when I came to Baylor, honestly. I thought I was going to honestly come in here and just, you know, jump from the free throw line like I was in high school, which didn't work out like that. <laughs> College is different, right? Right. Bigger guys, guys the same as you, athletic, everything. So it really woke me up. We call you an undersized big man, but I mean, at 6'5", 250, you're still able to impose your will out there. How do you think your game translates? I think it's done well in college, but where do you see your game translating at the next level? Uh, I see my game, a lot of comparisons is Dennis Rodman. I get a lot of comparisons as P.J. Tucker, uh, a little bit of Draymond Green, but uh, P.J. Tucker and Dennis Rodman, and I see myself as an athletic Tony Allen in a way because uh, of the defensive effort, too. And um, the reason I feel like a lot of people be like, well, he's a you know undersized guy, but he plays super big is because I'm fearless and relentless. And, I mean, uh, Coach Spruce did every time. Like, you got to be relentless and fearless. And, like, I play my role. I mean, um, I'm a huge role guy. Like, uh, you don't see me going out there trying to get 20 points a game or 30 points because that's – it would be selfish of me to take that from Jerry Bull and Macy O.T., great scores like that, Devion Mitchell. So um, I just develop a role, and as I came into that role, you know, that's how I am now. <laughs> I love it because we don't see people really – how do I say this? I think a lot of people's identity is so focused around scoring that they never really att attract their role. And I heard a great quote recently. I think maybe Fran said it, or maybe even it was Scott Drew that said this to you guys. You'll have to tell me. But – um, you know what they call role players in the NBA, you know, millionaires, like they're making millions of dollars to really accept their role. Like, has that sunk in that right. you, you don't have to be a scorer to be a successful player in basketball? Yeah, like, all right. So I'm glad you said that because I'm going to say it like this, like a lot of guys get their information from different guys outside of basketball and from different people that you need to come in and give 15 and 10 and you automatically a first round pick or you know, you got to score this and do this to be a first round and second round pick and be in the NBA. But honestly, if you play a role and you sacrifice and just be yourself and be a star in that role, I mean, the sky's the limit. I mean, look at me. Like, I'm not one of those guys that's getting 15 points and, all. you know, I play super hard. I play my role by rebounding, doing all the dirty work. Like, I remember Shaq saying one thing, like, why not go get paid a million dollars to rebound, like, do, get five rebounds a game or two steals? With zero points. Like at the same time, like I just I just like playing the, you know, being that role player and just, you know, staying focused on that. I mean, like I said, we got great scores on my team. And I just I much rather be a playmaker and let them do the, do all the work and I just do all the dirty work. Yeah, I think it's interesting because you impact the game maybe more than anybody else without <laughs> scoring. Like think of what a compliment that is that you That's impact true. the game. And it, and it, and it's so sometimes like I'm I'm going to keep it honest with you. Like, sometimes, like, you might feel that, well, me, I feel sometimes like, man, I'm not doing enough. I'm not doing this because, you know, you're not going to get the same recognition as some people that scoring those points. And you might not be a player of the game. You might not get the same accomplishments. But at the same time, if you're a winner and you play your role and the right people see it, you're going to be successful. And coaches did a good job preaching that to me. Like, you don't need all the accomplishments. I mean, if you play your role and you win in games, everybody's going to always see and like I said, like, I just love being that guy that's, you know, a headache for you every game. And I impact it in different ways. Like, it's it's more than just scoring the ball. I mean, you got to read my own defense, talking on the bench, um, stealing, uh, getting the crowd. You might be a guy that just needs to talk to the crowd and get them pumped up, you know, and 
wave a towel. I mean, it's different stuff you got to do. I mean, once everybody learned that a row is really important in basketball, in basketball go back to like it used to be instead of everybody trying to get 30 and 20 points. <laughs> right. I agree. You've been, I've seen you wearing this hoodie in the last couple of interviews that says glue guy. Where'd you get that? Oh, you got it on right now. Wait, yeah, pull it up. I got to take a picture of that. Give me the glue guy hoodie. I love it. Where'd you get that? Okay. So I remember coach Pete calling me Mr. 95. Um, he came up with the idea where I do everything. I remember me, you talked about it before where you do 95% of the stuff that nobody else wants to do. There you go. Yep. That's correct. And uh, I remember a friend talking on uh, ESPN one time, calling me a glue guy. And then I started looking it up, and it's always been stuck in my head of what's a glue guy and what's the definition of it. Like, I even got the definition on the back of it. And I just came up with the idea, like, I want to create my own jacket where, you know, it's this is me, and this is something I like, and that's how I am, and that's how everybody know me. Now, everybody's not going to know Mark Vidal for being the most – the person that's got all the buckets, but they're going to know me as being the most – relentless player to play college basketball or something like that, you know? Like, I'm about to be one of the, the most – I think I'm winning the most wins tomorrow. Yes, yes you're going to be the all-time win leader there at Baylor in Big 12 games. And if you guys go undefeated, you can break the all-time win record um, for all wins, not just Big 12 wins. Is that a goal you've got going? Man, like I said – that's, that's just me. I love winning. So that's stuff like that get me excited. Like nothing, nothing can beat that. Not no defensive player of the year. You know, none of that. Like that right there is – I love winning. I mean, <laughs> I can't, I'm, I'm excited. Like when I get that, I might cry tomorrow. All the hard oh. work and effort I put in. I mean, a lot of sacrifices and everything. I'm going to just – I don't know. I'm going to take in that moment. Winning matters. I love that so much. Okay, you brought up France. I, you know I got to get to this because you and Fran had a funny little a Twitter brief. Fran is our, I call him the godfather of the Big 12. He's my broadcast partner on Big 12 um, Big Monday games. And he kind of called you out on Twitter and said, you know, I hate to say this, but Mark Vidal is just not playing the way he normally does. Um, when you saw that, you you took offense. How did you respond? Fake news. I said fake, fake news. Fake news. That's why I told Fran. You know, uh, I love Fran, though. Like, uh, Fran, he's never never going to stir you wrong. But I knew when I got when I seen that tweet, I didn't take it, like, super personal and get mad. Instead, it motivated me. And I was like, okay, I'm just showing him. You know, and, like, I told him. Like, he understood that I was going through stuff. And he was just trying to motivate me to do more stuff because of what I was going through. You know, I had lost my high school coach. And then, you know, I had some family stuff going on. So, at the same time, he like, all right, Mark. We need you to get back to you. So he, he put that tweet out there. And like I told him, it was fake news. <laughs> I have a secret feeling that Scott Drew put him up to that. Have you asked I, Scott about that? I don't know. Hey, I know, but I don't know. So I'm going to say it like that. <laughs> I, already I know. know. I know. Um, it, I, I, I was worried about you a little bit, maybe, I don't know, like a month ago, because I thought maybe you were a little heavy. Are you Are you back in shape? Do you feel like you're where you need to be? Yeah, so uh, like I said, like I think more so was mentally for me. I wasn't that I was heavy. I was just mentally not into it. Like, okay. uh, like uh, I always tell people, and I tweet a lot if you follow me on Twitter, which you do, and you see a lot of stuff I talk about mental illness and mental stuff. That's it's a real thing. Like a lot of people made fun of, you know, Paul George for speaking out about, you know, stuff he was going through, and they made fun of him. But it's a real thing. And I was honestly like going through some stuff and. Mentally, I wasn't there. Like, it wasn't, you know, me being heavy. It's just that my my mindset to play basketball at the time wasn't there. And then, you know, Coach Drew and them did a good job. And Monique, which is a person that's, you know, works with us. And um, everything started to fall into place. Now I'm back to myself and I'm ready to go. Like I said, I had a bad first half. Now the second half only can be great. Yeah, I think it's important because I like that you're being honest about that. Maybe my version of heavy was you were playing heavy, maybe mentally, and it, and you weren't, you know, that bouncy, joyful person that we're used to. I think stuff's hard right now. I don't think we as humans are being honest enough about how hard everything is right now. I've had COVID for three weeks. I've been by myself in my house for three weeks. Right. I'm dying of loneliness right now. You know what I mean? Like, how yeah. do you express to the world, like, I need some help or I need some interaction or some motivation you know I'm like the sunniest person ever and I'm struggling so I know that it's important to speak out about it right like um I always tell guys that you can't really sit here and disguise you know 
what goes on. Like some things you can keep to yourself, but it's not going to be for long. It's going to eat you up inside. So, you know, mental, mentally, you need to talk to someone. It don't matter who it is. If you, if you got a pet, if you have to talk to your dog, you know, pets talk. I got a dog at home and some days I was calling myself crazy because I was talking to her. But at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's, it's a real thing. So you can't hold it in. I mean, you got to go out there and you got to talk to people. Um, you got to make yourself known that, you know, that it's, it's something wrong, you know? So, I mean, you can't just be out there and just holding everything in because it's going to eat you up. And really, when you talk to everybody, it's better for you because everybody's starting to feel your pain. And like I said, like when Paul George came out with it, you know, I was one of those guys like, uh, I don't know if he's, you know, like mentally he's there in this, but I was one of those guys too. So I just went through and I was like, man, yeah, it's a real thing. It's hard to ask for help. I think there's a lot of us that it's hard to say I'm struggling and I might need help. I know it's hard for me. So I appreciate you saying this very much. Yeah. Um, okay. So tell me about, you need to win 21 more games to be the all-time wins leader for uh, Baylor basketball. What will it take? Because if you win 21 games, that means you guys are the national champions. What is special and feels urgent about this group right now that makes you feel like you could do it? Man, I love my brothers. I love my coaches. Man, I I, I, I want to give a shout out to the GAs first. I'm going to start with them because, man, them dudes work so hard. Like, they work super hard. And, like, they sleep on a plane on film. I, like, I seen a couple of guys doing film sleep on a plane, and they work all night every day. And without them making the scouts for us, they do so much of a good job with the scouts, and then the coaches do a good job of breaking down. You know, it's more than just the players. It's really those guys behind the scenes. We just play basketball and follow what we got to do. But at the same time, like, those guys is, you know, the, all the little things count, and it's with them. And uh, for us, the team, we just got to just play our game. We ain't got to do nothing crazy. Just play our game, play hard every night. Like I said, if I if I become the, you know, the 21 games and I win all 21, I'd be the happiest man in the world. If I don't, I'm still going to be the happiest man in the world because at the end of the day, my brother's, they always have my back. And without them, I wouldn't even be, you know, where I'm at now with the win. So tomorrow, if we win tomorrow, I'm going to be so happy. And it's going to be for them. I love it. Okay, last question before I let you go. Um, you know, you guys got tested at Texas Tech. Um, there's been some games that have been challenging for you guys. Jared Butler wasn't great in that game, seven points. Uh -huh. What has gotten into him since then? Because he's got 66% from the field. He's shooting 81% from three. Tell me what's going on with Jared. Man, he, he always kept one thing about Jared and the team. Uh, he always keep guard first and the team keep guard first. He always kept guard first. And Jared, you know, even though he was going through that, he had his brothers behind us picking him up, just like they was doing for me, like covering for me. Like somebody was always picking him up. And now he's, you know, he's, he's doing way better, but he kept guard first. And if you keep guard first and, you know, keep him in all your plans. I mean, sky's the limit. And with Jared, you know, he just did a good job keeping going out first. He stayed patient. He didn't let it get to him, even though, you know, some games wasn't his game. Like, every dog have his day. I mean, hey, at the end of the day, he came back, and he did what he had to do. I love it. Okay. Well, next hoodie that you get, I want – Promise me you're going to get this hoodie, okay? I have an idea for you. Okay. I want you to get a hoodie where you're like – you're one right now that says glue guy. I want it to say walking joy. Walk in joy. Because I think you bring joy to people, Mark. You bring joy to me, everybody that gets to watch you play. So walking joy, can that be your next hoodie? I got you. Walking okay. joy. I love it. Thank you so much. Mark Vidal, just an absolute delight to watch you play. You do everything right. For all of us who appreciate the little stuff in basketball, you are our walking joy.